Located on the corner of 7th and Main Streets in the Skid Row portion of downtown Los Angeles. Sits but once was built to be an opulent traveler's hotel in downtown LA. Attracting traveling businessmen as they came and went about their work. However, not long after the Cecil's red opening, horrific events began to occur that would forever haunt it. And misfortune would continue to plague the site for its entire 100 year existence, even to modern times. Join me today as we take a look at the history of this horrific structure, discover why it acquired a tragic reputation, and what the future holds for the hotel. My name is Lee Brees, and this is Modern Ruins, Episode 4. In the late 1800s, Los Angeles was the end of the popular Transcontinental Railroad, with several rail yards located around town. Transients and displaced peoples who hopped on a boxcar or simply just rode the rails tended to congregate at rail yards. And LA being the end of the line, this effect was amplified. Neighborhoods around rail yards became a place where seasonal workers, displaced Civil War veterans, and other transients would collect. At the time, there were several slang terms used to describe these individuals, such as dynamiters, flybones, and hobos, with the latter becoming the most widely used term. Around these rail yards would pop up cheap hotels, eateries, brothels, saloons, and other low-end businesses. Of course, the amount of these businesses in LA was more than average. Just on the outskirts of what would become Skid Row and away from the rail yards and slums around it, sat a modest house that had been converted into a pet and fee store. Sometime in the mid-1920s, the house was sold to W.W. Payton and Associates, run by the hotelier, William Banks Hanner, who intended to demolish the converted house pet feed store and build a traveler's hotel. At the time, the site wasn't located in a particularly bad area. And the developers intended the hotel to become a place for businessmen to stay during their travels for work. As the site was located downtown and down the street from a rail station. The new hotel would be designed in the Beaux Arts style by architect Roy Lester Smith with Weymouth Crawlow Company being the builder. Smith having designed several other notable buildings in Los Angeles including the Lane Mortgage Company building in 1922 the City Club building in 1924, and an L.A. fire station. The developers took every chance to increase the hotel's opulence, with as many as five competing developments being constructed nearby. And they spent $1.5 million to construct the building. The completed project, which originally was meant to be named for the Metropolitan Hotel, but instead was named the Hotel Cecil and opened on December 20th, 1924, and featured 700 rooms. Smith designed the building with the classic tripartite division enhanced by terracotta and cast stone ornamentation that included coins, cornices, decorative window and door surrounds, and ornate columns and pilasters. The E-shaped design of the building allowed for airflow and more natural light. On the interior, the new building displayed a tall T-shaped lobby with stained glass and arc glass skylights, wrought iron decorative detailing, and had marble terrazzo flooring throughout. Sorry to geek out for all the architects and interior designers out there. All of the hotel's furnishings would be California made. Only 200 rooms featured a private bath and the rest shared a bath with a neighboring room. On opening night, a room with a shared bath cost $1.50, rooms with a private toilet $2, and rooms with a full private bath cost $2.50 a night. The hotel wanted to capture the travelers from the nearby rail station, and so in addition to the regular hotel rooms, Single room occupancy rooms were added for extended stays, which as the hotel got older, would attract the unruly and unscrupulous folks, rather than the traveling kind the hotel was attempting to attract. In the early years, the hotel experienced great success, but it wasn't long after the opening that the U.S. entered the Great Depression. The Cecil remained a place for international and highly successful businessmen to stay when they would travel. But as the depression wore on for nearly a decade and a half, the fight the hotel had to stay alive became weaker over time, 
as it was upstaged by newer developments in different parts of L.A. And by the end of the 1940s, the Cecil started to develop a reputation as a long-stay residence for the transients that populated the area of what we know today as Skid Row. In addition to this change in reputation, the hotel also began running a dark history. While not as significant at the time, this legacy would go on to become its most prominent feature today. The first tragic death at the Cecil was a man by the name of Percy Ormond Cook. Four years later, another guest by the name of W.K. Norton would pass away in his room. It would be another decade before the hotel would experience its next tragic event. But by then, the hotel continued to be dragged down by the shaky neighborhood around it. Los Angeles since the late 1800s have been growing its reputation as a home for the world's untouchable people. The disabled, the mentally ill, and the homeless were just a few of the much more complex people who migrated to this area. As early as the 1960s, but mainly in the 1970s and 1980s, city officials had to come to grips with this problem and find a way to mitigate the negative impact the spread of these individuals was having on the city as they continued to develop L.A. into the capital city of the West. The location of Beverly Hills and Hollywood, and the gateway to trade in the Pacific. As the city made development plans for its downtown, the plan for the untouchables that populated the developing areas was to confine them to a specific part of the city, Skid Row. Unfortunate for the Cecil, the hotel sat in a corner of two border streets in the neighborhood, on the edge of its sea yet separated from the limelight of Los Angeles. It once gleamed bright in, by an invisible border between what it once was and what it was becoming. When city officials began to border in the area to contain those already inhabiting the neighborhood, in addition to attracting people living outside the new invisible boundary, the hotel started to cater to people now restricted to its district, with even more long-term stays than overnight guests. The bordering process began by placing more benches, homeless shelters, and public bathrooms throughout the district to lure more people in. Which was then followed by replacing standard street lighting with harsh prison lighting on the border streets to deter anyone from crossing them at night. Trash cans in outside neighborhoods were fitted with locks to discourage homeless from spreading out to scavenge them for food. Further developments such as the war on drugs and skyrocketing rent prices in L.A. acted as a positive feedback loop to the containment of people to this area. And prisons, hospitals, and mental institutions would drop off people in this part of L.A., knowing they at least would be contained to this area. Early on in the strategy, Skid Row neighborhood leaders supported the measures the city was taking because they saw it as a way to maintain affordable housing without considering the long-term ramifications of such policies. In the 1980s, the Cecil had been enveloped by the containment policy for several decades. And its once opulent style now seemed that of place and had little to no value considering the condition the rest of the building had plummeted to. The Cecil had maintained a decade with almost no tragic activity, but the hotel then went in a different direction as the night stalker, Richard Ramirez, a serial killer and assaulter moved into the hotel from 1984 through 1985 until a group of locals who recognized him surrounded him one day outside the hotel. Ramirez would be found guilty of 13 murders, 5 attempted murders, and 11 sexual assaults. In the following decade, another serial killer, Jack Unaweger, stayed at the hotel and strangled three different sex workers to death during his stay there. Given the dissolving neighborhood it inhabited, the Cecil became a central place for drug operations and a frequent venue for sex workers. While Skid Row's population continued to fluctuate, the population was consistently over 50% homeless people, with the most recent figure saying that 41% of the residents live in poverty, and the median income was below $15,000. In 2007, the hotel was purchased for $27 million and was considered to be the worst in the downtown area. The new owners renovated portions of the Cecil, returning several SRO, single-room occupancy rooms for long-term guests, back to normal hotel rooms, and a hostel was added meant to attract European tourists. In 2011, 
A portion of the hotel containing normal rooms was rebranded to stay on Main, in an attempt to distance itself from the reputation the Cecil had acquired, with a separate reception desk from the rest of the hotel. In the age of online booking, this proved to be a well-working ploy to attract guests who otherwise would be deterred by the Cecil name. As at the time, the stay on Main averaged a 3.5 star review, and the Cecil a 2.5 star review on TripAdvisor. The stay on Main was situated on three floors of the building, and a room cost $60 per night. Even with these attempts to distance the hotel from its horrific past, the Cecil would suffer its first tragic event of the cable news and social media era. That would bring the hotel's history from a local notoriety to an internationally known spot of misfortune. In early 2013, a Canadian student by the name of Elisa Lamb was a guest of the hotel. She mysteriously disappeared and was last seen on January 31st. Five days after Amtrak footage showed she had arrived in L.A., detectives released security footage on February 13th, which showed Lamb conspicuously walked in and out of elevators, studying their buttons, hiding in the corner, then jumping out the door, looking both directions as if she was being chased. In addition to other unusual behavior, the footage went viral with more than 31 million views on YouTube as of writing this video. Six days later, residents began complaining of foul tasting in dark colored water, and a repairman was sent to the roof and found Lamb. Her death would inspire a four-part true crime show and became the most watched series or movie on Netflix in February 2021. And the circumstances of her death would inspire episodes of many crime drama shows. The LA coroner ruled her death accidental as she suffered from severe bipolar disorder. In a post-recession world, neighborhoods once considered off-limits to developers, such as Brooklyn, New York, and others across the globe, became subject to the relentless march of gentrification. And in 2014, Richard Bourne, a hotel yay yelling from Queens, saw no reason why the Cecil, surrounded by the glamour of downtown LA, couldn't become the next shining diamond from the rough. And it became Bourne's next experiment in urban renewal. At the time, Bourne already owned the Mercer, the Maritime, the Bowery, the Greenwich, the Ludlow, and the Jane. The last of which has a similar story to the Cecil. Born purchased the nearly century old hotel for $30 million, with plans to make the property the modern version of what it was originally, a traveler's hotel in downtown LA. The project would prove to be difficult, however, as residents and neighborhood officials fought Born's efforts to free the hotel from the low-income housing protections that prevented improving the building. Work pressed on, with Simon Barron Development signing a 99-year lease on the site, with intentions to keep the hotel's most notable design features, but fully gut the hotel otherwise, with the company being required to provide temporary housing to Cecil's affordable housing inhabitants during construction. Around the same time, the Cecil's reputation began to migrate into a broader cultural conscience. Cecil The Cecil became the inspiration for the fifth season of the series on FX, with the Cecil Hotel being referred to as the Cortez Hotel of Los Angeles. The season premiere opened to almost 6 million viewers. In, two in 2017, despite the site's horrific history, the Los Angeles City Council declared the Cecil Hotel to be a historic cultural monument which meant all plans born or any other developer would have for the structure would have to be approved by the council. Born's final renovation plans for the Cecil were to remodel the 301 single occupancy rooms that had not been done so on prior renovations, eliminating 10 rooms, leaving 291 total guest rooms as 10 were needed for managers on the floors. The Skid Row Housing Trust would operate the SRO rooms for those making 60% or less of the median income. The building closed entirely for renovations in 2017, but work never really started and was then suspended once the COVID-19 pandemic hit America. And that is where the Cecil currently sits today, along with Skid Row, which has more homeless and mentally ill people than it's ever had in its entire history to this point. 
The Cecil Hotel doesn't have the same iconic status like other hotels across the U.S. But it does have a strong cultural significance to Skid Row and broader Los Angeles. And given the adaptations of the Cecil's horrific events, one could argue the building has acquired cult status and new significance in the age of the Internet. The Cecil never got a chance to shine as bright as it could have, being built on the cusp of the Great Depression. And the unfortunate events that occurred throughout its history have given it a reputation I'm sure the developers and several owners never wanted. This one is sort of tricky. The location of the hotel is somewhat precarious to the development technically being Skid Row. But Bourne believes strongly that the hotel is a great candidate for urban renewal, given the hotel's proximity to downtown LA. It's discouraging that affordable housing and other restrictions have placed significant controls on what can be done to the building. The Cecil's ultimate fate, in my point of view, should be a dramatic renovation. The lobby and mezzanine are really the only iconic parts of the hotel, with the rest of the building being severely out of date and out of touch with layouts and modern designs of today. I wouldn't necessarily demolish the whole structure, who knows how much it would truly cost to build an equivalent structure in downtown Los Angeles from scratch. Although the site has significant architectural significance, the hotel's horrific history should have prevented the site from acquiring historic preservation status. And the plague of tragic events should be allowed to end with the end of the hotel itself. A dramatic renovation makes the most sense, and with new ownership and a completely different looking hotel on the inside, Maybe the structure could last for well over another century and be something that can write its own story and become a shining landmark that acts as a beacon of hope and optimism for the rest of the neighborhood to which it calls home. And on that note, thank you for watching. Subscribe to La Bruce TV for more Modern Ruins content. And be sure to comment what Modern Ruin you'd like us to cover next.